Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? You made it through your first week. Let's see. Before we start um, the lecture today, so we are going to start into chapter four this week. But before we start that, I want to um, see if anybody has any questions or um, any questions first on chapter one material. How about any questions um, on just sort of technical stuff, um, anything that any issues you've run into and so stuff. far? Not chapter four won't unlock. Did you complete chapter one? Yes, ma'am. Um, There's probably a video that you didn't watch, I think, because mine wouldn't unlock either until I watched one of the videos that's on the chapter one module, I think. Okay. Let's try that. Yes. You have to go through every single one of those things in each module before the next module will unlock. Okay. <clears throat> but Madeline, if that doesn't work, shoot me a message in Canvas and let me know. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I got a lot of um, emails last week where people were having some issues with um, saving their lab answers. So there was a video in the module walking you through that. Um, some people said they couldn't watch it. And so I also posted an announcement about that. So is everyone okay being able to first download and save the PDF? then fill it in, you can type your answers in, it's available form, and then upload it. Yes. Okay, good. Um, I will tell you that some of the folks that are working from, if you're working from a Chromebook, a Chromebook uh, that is more than, I think, two years old, Chromebooks are notorious for having the inability to open PDF documents. Um, so if you are working from a Chromebook and you're having problems with the lab documents, then you need to reach out and to um, e-learning at sheltonstate.edu. Um, just send, send an email and hopefully they can give you some um, alternative ways to complete those documents. I don't have a Chromebook, but I do know that um, Chromebooks just for some reason are unable to open PDF documents, which is crazy because those are really common forms of documents. Okay. I have a, a Chromebook and I haven't had that problem yet. Is your Chromebook newer? It might be about three years old. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, yeah. yeah, from what I understand from what some of the tech people have told me is that most of the issues that they're getting from students is from people working from Chromebooks that are more than two years old. So maybe yours has had some kind of patch or update, Anna, that has helped. Okay. Um, I will tell you that for this very first week, you know, last week for our first week, um, I work seven days a week. So you send me a message, I am getting right back to you. Um, I can't do that all semester. I have a family, I have a husband, I have a child. So from the, for the rest of the semester, I'm essentially Monday through Friday. Um, if you need me on the weekends, I am not going to have a very quick turnaround response. Um, so I'm encouraging you to not put things off until Saturday and Sunday. I can't help you at that point. Um, really, Saturday and Sunday is just sort of study time. I am giving you those days, those extra days. I know a lot of you work. So just in case you need them, you have them. But it is not a time to wait until the absolute last minute to complete all of your weekly assignments. So make sure that you're working along the way um, and don't wait until the last minute to complete stuff, okay? All right. Um, so last week for lecture, we did chapter one, and chapter one focuses on just sort of the language of anatomy. So we walked through things like, what is anatomy? 
What is physiology? We walked through all the different organ systems in the body. We talked about things like homeostasis. And then last Wednesday, I walked you through a lot of the anatomical terms that you also saw in the lab document. Now today, after our lecture, right after our lecture, there is a new Zoom meeting that will start at 10 o'clock, and I will go over that lab document that you just completed from chapter one. So I will pull it up on the screen, I will go over every answer with you, we'll talk about them. That way you have the correct answers, okay, so that you know that you are studying the correct uh, structures for the lab exam. So we'll do that at 10 o'clock today. I make it a separate Zoom meeting so that if you can't attend, um, it's recorded separate from the lecture. So that way we'll have a lecture recording and we'll have a lab recording, okay? So once we're done with our lecture this morning, we'll log off of here and then pop back in one more time using that other Zoom meeting, okay? I am going to share my screen with you and we are going to work through chapter four today. All right, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. So um, I will tell you that chapter four is a super long chapter. Um, it is probably most students' least favorite chapter. Um, it is on tissues. Um, and um, tissues can be kind of boring, but they are the foundation of all of our organ systems. Because remember, if we take atoms and molecules and hook them together, we get cells. Cells make tissues. Tissues, more than one type of tissue makes an organ. Um, so it is a sort of boring chapter, but it's a foundational chapter. And um, I will tell you that this lab is also kind of difficult um, working with tissues. So it is so important that as we go through these tissues that you really take good notes, that you pay attention to some of the characteristics of the tissues as I walk you through them, okay? So really what we're gonna be working with today, there are four main kinds of tissues in the human body. There is epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is always a covering or a lining. So as a covering, it would be like your skin and lining, it would be like lining the inside of your mouth, lining the inside of your digestive tract. And then also epithelial tissue, sorry, my dog and cat are fighting. Hey, stop, stop. Sorry, this is embarrassing. <laughs> Quit. <coughs> hang on, hang on. Sorry, real life over here in the pew house. The dog loves the cat, she's a puppy and the cat hates everybody, so. <laughs> dog doesn't get it yet. All right, so epithelial tissue is a covering or a lining, but also if you think about it, where you have glands of the body, like in your skin. Remember, you've got sweat glands, you've got oil glands. Epithelial tissue is also gonna make those, okay? The second kind of tissue we have is connective tissue. Connective tissue does exactly what it sounds like it does. It connects things together. So this would be things like connective tissue proper. And I know you don't know what that is. That would be like tendons. I'm gonna try to write in here. Tendons and ligaments. That's connective tissue proper. Remember tendons, these are gonna connect muscle to bone. So they're connecting things together. Ligaments connect bone to bone. We also have cartilage. We have bone and we have blood, right? So all connective tissues connect things together. We also have another type of tissue is muscle tissue. And the three kinds of muscle tissue we'll walk through are skeletal, this connects to your skeleton, cardiac, this makes your heart, and smooth. Smooth muscle is found inside hollow organs of the body. So like it's found in the stomach, helping the stomach churn your food. It's found in your blood vessels, helping to move blood. And then the last type of tissue we'll walk through is nervous tissue, okay? That's in your brain and spinal cord. So those are the four kinds of tissues that we are gonna walk through. 
in this chapter. Today, I'm going to try to get us through the first two, epithelial and connective tissues. Okay. So remember, if we think of the levels of organization, we start with atoms and molecules, hook those up together to make cells. Cells working together make tissues. Okay. So tissues are groups of cells that are very similar in their structure and function. The cells have to work together. And a lot of times in our tissues, the type of cell in the tissue is very specialized for that tissue. Think about nervous tissue, for example. The type of cell in nervous tissue, one type of cell, it's called a neuron. And neurons send signals. Well, that's a very specialized type of cell, but if we think about nervous tissue like the brain, its function is to send signals, right, and to communicate to different areas of the body. So the cells in our tissues are very specialized. So I just walked you through the four types of tissues in the body. So remember we have epithelial tissue. We have connective tissue. I'm just going to write CT up here. What tissue is involved in movement? That should be an easy one, right? Muscle. Muscle. Yeah, muscle. And then I've got to move my things out of the way because I can't see, which I don't think I can move them out of the way. Um, and then the very last one on the bottom, I think says control, but I can't read it. Is that what it says down there? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right. Sorry, my um, my tools for Zoom are down at the very bottom. All right. So that's nervous tissue. Okay. So those are the four tissues that we're walking through. Those are the just very general functions of those tissues. And then this is a great picture from your textbook. So this one basically just shows all four types of tissues and sort of how they're scattered throughout the body, right? Like a nervous tissue, you can see at the very top, we've got our brain and spinal cord. Muscle, remember we have skeletal, cardiac, and smooth, so that's found throughout the entire body. Epithelial, it's a covering or a lining, so like the skin, lining the inside of your intestines. And then connective tissues, we have lots of those. Those connect things together. They provide support. So this is going to be things like bones and tendons and fat. Okay. So again, if we think back to those levels of organization, if we have tissues that are made of cells, then if we take some tissues and hook them together, at least two tissues make an organ. Okay. So an organ has to have at least two types of tissue. That looks funky, doesn't it? There we go. Um, but usually your organs have all four types of tissues. So let's think of, for example, stomach. Okay, your stomach is an organ. What kind of tissue would line the inside of your stomach? Which one's a covering or a lining? Epithelial. Yes, so epithelial lining the inside of the stomach, okay. Um, can your stomach move? Can it churn food? Yes, so what kind of muscle is found in your stomach? Skeletal, cardiac, or smooth? Smooth. Smooth. Smooth is in our hollow organs, right? So now we've got epithelial tissue. We've got smooth muscle. Can you feel your stomach? Like, can you feel when it's full or when it's empty? What kind of tissue would help with that? Nervous. Nervous tissue. So we've got three right there. Connective tissue is another one that's also in the stomach that's connecting all those things together. And so right there, that's just one example, but that's what we can do with almost every organ in the body is we can walk through and we can talk about all four types of tissues in that organ. So for it to be classified as an organ, it has to have at least two tissues, right? Because one tissue is a tissue. So two tissues make an organ, but most organs have all four types of tissues. Now the term for studying tissues is called histology. So that, pre, that ending ology means study of and hist means tissue. So histology is the study of tissues. Now I want to explain this part to you because this is the part that makes histology so difficult. And that is 
how are we studying these tissues? So what we do is typically we'll take a specimen and a lot of times the specimen we're using is an organ, right? So it might be an organ from a human, it might be an organ from a rat or a cat or some other species, but we take an organ and first we have to fix it, preserve it so it doesn't break down. So we preserve the organ. And then a lot of times um, we'll dip it, this sounds weird, but it gets dipped in like parafilm, like the waxy stuff. You know, ladies, if you've ever had the hand treatments that are amazing, where you dip your hands in the wax, it's kind of like that. So they dip that organ in wax and then they use what kind of looks like um, a deli meat slicer and they slice that organ into really, really paper thin sections. And then they'll stain it so that certain structures um, pop a little bit better. So they'll stain it so you might be able to see the nuclei of the cells in that tissue a little bit better. Or you might be able to see different kinds of fibers better. And then they mount it onto a slide. So they'll actually put it onto a slide put a, and glue a cover slip on top. And that's how we get a tissue slide, okay? So I'm gonna go back to the very beginning of what I told you. Remember, they're starting with an organ. How many tissues are typically in an organ? Four. So a lot of times when you are looking at histology slides, especially when we are in class, a lot of times I'll hand you a slide and it might say on there that you are looking at stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And you're going to put it under the microscope. And guess what? There's three different kinds of tissue under that slide because you're looking at an organ, you're not just looking at that one kind of tissue. Um, and so it's always important to kind of keep that in mind. You also have to keep in mind when we're looking at slides that a lot of times what's used to stain the slide, maybe to stain the nuclei. Sometimes the stain they use, the nuclei are black. Sometimes they're pink, sometimes they're blue. So it just depends on the stain. So you're never ever gonna get two slides, two images that look identical. That is super important, especially when we talk about these tissues as we go through the lecture today and as you do the lab. There are no images in your lab manual that are going to match exactly with the images in your textbook. It's impossible to do that. I can't use those images, they're copyrighted, and there's no way I can never get a slide that's gonna look exactly like what they used. Um, and so just kind of keep that in mind that it gets a little tricky because things might look a little bit different in terms of color, but if we always remember the overall structure and characteristics of our tissues, we should be able to identify them, okay? So we are gonna start this morning on epithelial tissue. Okay, so remember epithelium is a covering or a lining. So it'd be like your skin. Um, and it also lines open body cavities. So like your digestive cavity, like your mouth, your respiratory, like your nose, the urogenital tracts, those are all lined with epithelium. And then also it's covering the ventral body cavity. So remember we talked about how um, we have these serous membranes, they're made of epithelial tissue. We also have epithelium that occurs in our glands. So we call that glandular epithelium. So we'll talk about that just a little bit as well. We'll probably talk a little bit more about glands in the next chapter, chapter five. We'll get into the skin and we'll start talking about organ systems in chapter five, where we'll talk more about our glands then. All right, so before we go into different kinds of epithelial tissue in the body, um, I do wanna walk you through, in general, these are characteristics that all epithelial tissue has. So whether we're looking at your skin or what's lining your mouth, all epithelial tissue always has these particular characteristics. So the very first one is that it's cellular. That just means that it has a ton of cells inside of it there's not a lot of other stuff in epithelial tissues. When you look at epithelium under a microscope, it just looks like cell next to cell, next to cell, next to cell. So we say that its cells are very closely packed and there is very little extra cellular material. Extracellular is exactly what it sounds like it is. Extra meaning other stuff. So there isn't much stuff outside the cells. The other characteristic is that it has a polarity. 
And that means that there's always going to be a surface that's free, that nothing is attached to. And then there is a surface where something, it is attached to something else. And so I'm gonna give you an example of like your skin, right? This part of my skin that I am touching, this would be the free surface, right? There's nothing attached out here, this is open. But if I were to take a pin and stick it through my skin or a needle, eventually I'd go from epithelial tissue into another kind of tissue. Where it's connected to the other tissue, that's the attached surface. Okay, so epithelium always has a free surface and an attached surface. The apical surface is the free surface. The basal surface is the attached surface. A lot of times the cells on the apical surface, the free surface, will look a little different than the ones that are on the attached surface. Apical surface cells, a lot of times they can just be smooth. So um, let me see if I can pull up just a whiteboard and y'all can look at that. Okay, so on the apical surface, sometimes we might have cells that just look like this. So I'm gonna draw some epithelial tissue with my mad drawing skills. I took art in college, look, I was pretty good. You would never know today. So what we're looking at here is this would be my epithelial tissue at the top. You can see all those cells. And then down here where I drew these lines, this would be a different kind of tissue. So I'm going to say that, let me do this in a different color. Up here at the top, this is my apical surface, right? So all of this up here, that's the free surface. It's not connected to anything else. But then if we go down here, this part down in here, that would be the basal surface. Right, that's where it's attached to another tissue. Now you can see from this drawing, the apical surface cells are nice and smooth at the top. And sometimes we'll have that. Sometimes we'll have apical cells where we have little hairs on the surface called cilia. So I'm gonna do the same drawing. And this time I'm gonna have little cilia on the surface. Now, the function of cilia is they can actually help to propel things like mucus across the surface. So we have a lot of cilia lining the respiratory tract. It helps to move our dirty mucus out of the body. Okay, so sometimes we'll have cilia. And then sometimes we'll also have structures called microvilli. So the surface cells, the apical surface cells, have these sort of indentations, these little invaginations. Okay, so you can see at the very top, those little invaginations, those are called microvilli. And the function of microvilli is they actually increase the surface area. So think about it this way. Um, if I have an area from here to here and I have a string that's nice and straight, then you can see that it covers, you know, that, that two inches right there. But if I have the same two inches, but instead I take that string and I go like this, well, I have a much greater surface area, don't I? Because if I were to stretch that string out, it's not just two inches, it's really four right? And that's what microvilli do, is they actually help to increase the surface area, and that is fantastic when we're looking at things like lining the intestines. Lining the small intestine, you have a lot of microvilli because in your small intestine, you're absorbing nutrients. So we want a greater surface area so we can do a better job of absorbing nutrients out of our food. So let me go back to our PowerPoint. Didn't know it would take me back to where we started. All right. And so we just walked through um, some of, there we go, um, some of these different things that we can find on the surface of our epithelial cells. Another thing that all epithelial cells have in common is they all have special contacts holding them together. So they all have either things like 
tight junctions. Tight junctions are exactly what they sound like. So where you have the cells, they're held together very tightly. We can also have something called desmosomes. That's this picture in the middle. where you have two cells and they're held together by some linker proteins that let the cells kind of move a little bit. Or you have something called gap junctions. And gap junctions um, have a little gap between them so that you create a channel between the two cells and they can send signals back and forth to each other. So epithelial cells always have special contacts. Another characteristic of all epithelium is that it always has to have support underneath. So under the basal surface cells, you will always have something called a basement membrane. That one should be really easy to remember because if you think of a basement, you find the basement in the bottom of the house. So if we look at this image on the left over here, we can see that's our epithelial cells. You can see they're real tall epithelial cells. And that blue line right there, that is the basement membrane. You have to have something on the basal surface supporting those epithelial cells. Okay. Now the basement membrane you can see from the image in the middle, it has different layers to it. You don't have to worry about that. I'm not going to ask you about that. You just need to know about the basement membrane. And then the last couple of characteristics, um, number five, it is avascular. Anytime you see this qualifier A in front of something, it means not. So epithelial tissue is not vascular, it does not have a blood supply but it is innervative, so it does have nerves. So you might be thinking, well, when I cut my skin, it bleeds, so there has to be a blood supply. Have you ever gotten a paper cut where it doesn't bleed, but it hurts like the dickens? So that is showing you that your epithelial tissue is avascular, there's no blood supply, but it has a great nerve supply to it. Um, now, if you have cut yourself deep enough that you're bleeding, then you have actually cut down into another type of tissue that does have a blood supply, okay? But epithelium does not have a blood supply. It gets its nutrients from diffusion. So I'm going to go back to this picture. So the underlying tissue, like this tissue down in here, this has a blood supply. And so the nutrients would naturally just diffuse up into your epithelial tissue cells, because cells are living and they have to get nutrients. And then one of the last ones is that epithelium has a really high regeneration capacity. Um, so what that means is that if you cut your epithelial tissue, if you destroy the apical surface or the basal surface, it will get replaced very fast as long as you have adequate nutrition. So this is why you get a paper cut and usually the next day it's our, your body's already sealed it, right? You don't even notice it was there anymore. Um, an example of when you might not have adequate nutrition, great example would be a burn. Think like a third degree burn. A third degree burn goes through all three layers of your skin, of your, um, of your skin, your epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. And when it goes through all three layers, it basically cauterizes your blood vessels. And so you're not getting nutrients. You're not getting a blood supply or nutrients out to your skin anymore. And in that case, that's when a lot of people with a third degree burn have to have a tissue graft. So they have to have skin from somewhere else in their body put in that area. And then a lot of times they have to have a wound vac put on where it's sort of like, um, it'd be like if I burn my arm, they would kind of wrap it. It looks like cellophane and pull a vacuum on it. They're trying to pull the nutrients from deep inside your body out to the skin so it'll regenerate, okay? All right, so those are just very general characteristics of all epithelial tissue. Um, it has a high regeneration capacity, has an apical and a basal surface, it has certain connections, has a lot of cells in it. So this is, no matter what epithelium we're looking at, that's what we're gonna see. Now for epithelial tissue, I will tell you, I think this is the easiest type of tissue to name and describe because all you have to do is be descriptive and you got the name of it. So it always has two names. The first name is the number of layers that you're looking at. So simple just means that there's only one cell layer. Stratified means more than one. The second name in epithelial tissue will tell you the shape. 
of the cells. So if the cells are squamous in shape, think flat. Okay, these are flat shaped cells. And then cuboidal is cube shaped, columnar, column shaped. Okay. So here's a great example. We can see um, the image at the top. This would be, we would call this a simple epithelium, right? You can see there is just one cell layer right there, one cell layer thick. The one at the bottom you can see is a stratified epithelium because it's multiple cell layers thick. Now let's do the second name. The second name is the shape of the cells. So the picture at the top, what is the shape of those cells? Are they column, cubed, or squamous? Squamous. Yeah, so these are simple squamous. So we would say this is a simple squamous epithelial tissue. And then the ones at the bottom, this one gets a little tricky. When you're looking at something stratified, you can see that the shape of the cell down at the bottom versus the shapes of the cells at the top look a little different, right? They're a little more cubed at the bottom than they are at the top. You will always name a stratified epithelium based on the shape at the top. So based on the shape at the apical surface. So we would say this is a stratified squamous epithelial tissue, right? Because these are flat at the top. Okay, so we're naming them based on the shape at the apical surface. This is just showing you some different shapes. So we've got squamous cuboidal columnar. The only one that can sometimes get a little complicated is squamous. I always think of squamous cells as like dinner plates. You know, if you look at a dinner plate from the side, it looks really flat. But if you take that dinner plate and sort of rotate it, it's gonna look a little more round, right? So squamous can appear a little different depending on how the tissue was sectioned before it was mounted on a slide. But cuboidal is always cubed and columnar is always column shaped. So before we go through our different kinds of epithelial tissue, um, I want to walk you through the function of your epithelial tissues. Um, there are two main functions and the function is based on the structure of the tissue. So we always say if it is a simple epithelium, right? If it is one cell layer thick, then its function because it's really thin is gonna be absorbing. It can absorb nutrients really well or secreting or filtering. So a simple epithelium, a skinny thin epithelium, one cell layer thick, its function is always absorption, secretion, filtration. If it's a thick stratified epithelium, its main function is always going to be protection. Protection from abrasion, protection from wear and tear. So what kind of epithelial do you, tissue do you think is in your skin? Is it simple or stratified? Stratified. Yeah, stratified. stratified. So it's going to be stratified. It's going to have multiple layers because it's there for protection. Okay. So keep that in mind. I'm going to star this slide. This is really helpful, especially when you're taking an exam. I'll ask you a couple of questions about functions of tissues, um, especially epithelial tissues. So if you just remember these two things, you'll get all those questions correct. Um, so um, definitely star this one and remember that. All right, so we're going to walk through our epithelial tissues. We're going to do simple epithelium, so all the different kinds of simple, and then we'll do our stratified. So we'll start with simple. This is um, simple squamous is the first one we'll do. This is one layer of very flat-shaped cells. And the function, remember, it is simple epithelium. So the function is always going to be absorption, filtration, secretion, always. A lot of times we can find simple squamous inside the body um, and when it's inside the body instead of calling it epithelium you might see in your book you might see it called endothelium 
And the reason for that, epi means above or on top. So when we talk about your skin, for example, we would call it epithelial tissue. But if it's inside the body, instead of calling it epithelium, a lot of times we call it endothelium. Okay, I don't do that. I'm that. I think that just is very confusing, so I won't be doing that. Um, but just so you know, if you're reading your textbook, you might see that term. So where do we find a simple squamous epithelial tissue? Something really thin, one cell layer thick, very flat cells. Um, we're going to find it all over the place. We might find it in places like the lungs. So the alveoli of your lungs, little air sacs in your lungs. Think about it. When you breathe in, that air goes into the alveoli, and from the alveoli, it has to diffuse out into your bloodstream. So having this really nice, thin, simple squamous epithelial tissue around the alveoli is great for being able to move gases back and forth, okay? So that's just one example. So here it is in this image. You can see the alveoli of the lungs. And what you're looking at, um, so you can see, let me see if I can use a different color here so you can see better. I'm gonna draw a black line right here. What I'm drawing on is that simple squamous epithelial tissue. You can see how thin it is. So this right here, this sort of center part, this is not a cell. Um, this is actually the air sac. So your oxygen goes in here when you breathe and from there, it's going to diffuse out into your bloodstream. So you can see there are some little capillaries in here, like here's a capillary, okay? Um, and so you can actually see like the little nuclei of all that simple squamous epithelial cells. So those are those really flat shaped cells. Okay. Oh, it didn't like that for some reason. There we go. Ooh, let's see if I can erase that. No, hang on. I tried something new. There we go. All right. So another one is um, simple cuboidal. Simple cuboidal is one single layer of cube-shaped cells. Um, so the nuclei are a little bit bigger since the cell is bigger. Again, it's simple epithelium. So the function is absorption, secretion, filtration. And we're gonna find this in places like, um, you'll find it in kidneys, you might find it in some of your small glands, you might find it on the surface of the ovaries. This is showing you in the kidneys, okay? So you can see the kidneys here. And here is our simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. So I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna draw right here, you can see my red line. That would be the basal surface of those cells. So there's my basement membrane. And then in white right in the middle, I'm going to write an L. Okay, that white in the middle, that's the, we call it a lumen, that's the opening. And so that would be the apical surface of those cells. And you can see all those cells, they're very cube-shaped cells, and you can see the nuclei in there. So this is simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. All right, and then the last one is simple columnar. Simple columnar is one layer of column-shaped cells. A lot of times you'll see some cilia on the surface. Um, and remember, cilia are like little tiny hairs and they help to move things through internal passageways. So we're gonna find ciliated types in the respiratory tract, like in your bronchi helping to move mucus. We're gonna find ciliated types in the fallopian tubes. Um, what would the cilia be moving in the fallopian tubes? It's the egg, right? So when the ovaries release the egg, it's gotta move down the fallopian tubes. So the cilia can help propel that egg through the fallopian tubes. And same thing in the uterus. 
Non-ciliated forms might be in like your digestive tract and your gallbladder where you have muscle that is moving food. So cilia is really tiny, it's microscopic. It's not gonna do a good job of moving big stuff like food, but it can do a good job of moving things like cells like the egg through a fallopian tube or even kind of propelling mucus that's lining a respiratory tract. Again, it's still simple. So the function is still absorption, secretion, filtration. One type of cell that we'll find a lot of times if we're looking at ciliated versions of this tissue is a goblet cell. We'll talk way more about this cell in the next chapter, but this is a cell that makes mucus, it secretes mucus. Okay, so this is an example here. This is from the intestines. Um, and so this is gonna be simple columnar epithelium. Um, you can see that there is no cilia here. Um, and I'll draw in red right here. This would be the basement membrane. So that's the basal surface where those cells are connected to the basement membrane. This right here would be the apical surface of the cell, okay? And then we can do the same thing on the other side. Here's the apical surface. And then down here would be the basal surface because there's our basement membrane. So the food would be moving through right here. Okay, so that's just basically looking at the intestines up close. And now you can see those cells are very cube shaped cells. They have a big old nucleus in them. Okay, so that is one layer of cube shaped cells. So simple cuboidal epithelium. Okay, so we have done simple squamous. Let's flip back to our picture. Simple squamous, very, very, very flat cells around here. We have done simple cuboidal, one layer of cube-shaped cells, and simple columnar, one layer of column-shaped cells. Now, there is one more type of simple epithelium that I want to walk you through called pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. Um, pseudo this prefix pseudo means false, right? So pseudo stratified means it's falsely stratified. So it might look like it's more than one layer, but it's not, it's only one layer. Um, and the reason it looks like it's more than one layer is because the cells have slightly different heights to them. So it makes it look like they're more than one layer. The nuclei end up being at different heights. So it looks like more than one layer. But in reality, all the cells are attached at the basal surface, okay? Um, because it is not stratified, that means it's still simple. So it is still a single layer of cells. So the function is still absorption, secretion, filtration. Um, and its big job is moving mucus. So you might find this in the respiratory tract. You also might find this in places like the vas deferens in a male. This carries the sperm in men. So this is um, an image of that. So this is in the respiratory tract. And so what we're looking at here, um, I'm gonna draw my line here. This is my basement membrane. So that, that's the basal surface. Okay, up here, that's that white part. That's our free surface. So this is the apical surface at the top. And now you can see at the apical surface, all these little cilia up here. Again, they do a great job of moving mucus. But you can kind of see when you look at this why this looks like it might be more than one layer because you can see the nuclei. They're all at different heights. Every one of these cells is actually connected to the basement membrane. So it gives it this sort of falsely stratified appearance. This image over here on the left is a really good one um, because it's just showing you how it is still only one layer. The cells are just different heights. So you might be thinking, um, okay, so this one looks like it's stratified, but it's not stratified. So how would I know if it is really stratified versus if it's fake stratified, right? Pseudo stratified. So that's the next one I'm gonna walk you through. But before I walk you through the characteristics of a stratified epithelium, I'm gonna show you a picture of it. So if we look at this image, this is a stratified epithelium. 
So you can see all of this is all epithelial tissue. Anything that's in that red is epithelial tissue. And you can definitely see how this one is stratified. You can see those nuclei all over and you can tell that it's more than one cell layer thick. So stratified always will look like this. Pseudostratified looks more like this, okay? So for a stratified epithelium, um, it is more than one cell layer thick. It's usually a nice thick tissue. Cells on the apical surface are always squamous. They are always flat. Cells below the apical surface can be more cuboidal or columnar in shape. And remember, it's stratified, so its function is protection, protection from abrasion and wear and tear. Now, a lot of times we'll find um, keratinized stratified epithelium. Um, keratin is a really hard protective waterproof protein. We find it in our hair. We find the same protein that's even harder in our nails. Okay, um, And so sometimes we'll find the keratinized layers in parts of our epidermis, um, but areas that are not keratinized, places where you would not need that waterproofing. Um, you don't need waterproofing like in your mouth and your esophagus and in the vagina, right? You don't need the keratin there. So those would have non-keratinized cells. They don't need the waterproof protein. Um, now, if we think about this bottom bullet and all the places we're finding stratified epithelium, right? We have it in our skin. It's there for protection. We have it lining our mouth. It's there for protection, right? We don't all eat applesauce and baby food every day. Um, my son's favorite cereal right now, I, sh I'm, I feel like such a bad mom. <laughs> He's getting like cinnamon toast crunch and Captain Crunch, but his favorite is Captain Crunch, which that was my favorite as a kid too. But dang, it will tear your mouth up. It is like eating glass. You have to let it get all soggy in your milk first. And so it is so important. You know, we eat hot food. We eat food that um, can really abrade the lining of our mouth. So we have to have a stratified epithelial tissue in our mouth. And then same thing with the vagina, right? We have to have protection from wear and tear, protection from abrasion. So here is that picture of our stratified epithelial tissue. Again, you can see at the surface, like you can tell, it's hard to see the individual cells, but you can definitely see the nuclei and you can tell the nuclei are very flat. So that's how we know it's squamous, right? This is our apical surface up here. It's white, it's free, there's nothing attached. Down here is our basal surface, right? That's that area that's attached. Now there's just a few other epithelial tissues I'll mention. Um, one of them is called a transitional epithelium. This one gets its name because it actually has a, an appearance that varies. It varies on the distension of the organ. Um, so we're gonna find transitional epithelium in organs that will stretch up as they fill. So a great example of that is gonna be in the urinary tract. So like the bladder, as the bladder fills, think of a balloon, blowing up a balloon, it's gonna stretch. And so what we'll find is that when the bladder is empty, the epithelial lining in there is actually pretty thick. It's about six cell layers thick. The cells that are on the apical surface have sort of a bubbled shape to them. They have a dome shape. But as the bladder fills up with urine, it's going to stretch out. Think of a balloon, right? If you get like a, a navy balloon, latex balloon, when it is deflated, the latex is really thick and it almost looks black. And then as you start blowing the balloon up, as the latex thins out, then you can start to see the color, right? You can see the navy color. It's kind of the same here with the bladder, right? In this transitional epithelium. It's really thick when it's empty, but as it stretches, as it fills, it's going to stretch and get thinner. So it'll go down to about three cell layers thick. And the dome shape of the cells on the apical surface will go away. They'll become more flat. Okay, so this is a great picture. Um, we can see, again, I'll draw that line. There's my basal surface, okay, attached to the basement membrane. At the top is my apical surface. Okay, look at the cells on the apical surface here. They are definitely bubbled. They are domed. 
So is that bladder empty or full? It is empty. So it's nice and thick, got a, sit, a really thick transitional epithelium here and the cells on the apical surface are bubbled up, they're dome shaped, so we know it's an empty bladder. If the bladder were to fill, those cells on the apical surface would stretch out and they would be, get more flat. All right, <clears throat> now we've walked through all of our different types of epithelium. And again, you know, I think if we just kind of scroll back through these images, all you have to do, it has two names, and all you have to do is just be descriptive, right? So if we look here, this is stratified squamous. It's more than one cell layer thick. Cells at the surface are flat, stratified squamous. This one is pseudostratified. Okay, that one doesn't really follow the rules there. This one is simple columnar, one cell layer thick, column shaped. Simple cuboidal, one cell layer thick, cube shaped and simple squamous, one cell layer thick, flat. So these are really easy, I think, just be descriptive um, and you'll be able to identify the type of tissue. Now remember epithelium is not only a covering or a lining, but it also makes the glands of the body. Um, and glands are just cells that secrete um, an aqueous fluid or a secretion. So we have different glands in the body. Um, we have glands that secrete internally, and we call these glands endocrine glands, okay, internally secre secreting, because remember endo means inside. Then we also have exocrine glands, and these are externally secreting. So this would be things like sweat glands and oil glands, salivary glands, anything that's secreting out of the body. Um, endocrine glands, I am not gonna spend a huge amount of time on these in this chapter. We have an entire chapter at the end of the semester, chapter 16, where we will focus on the endocrine system. Um, endocrine glands are the glands in the body that secrete hormones. So they're releasing right into your bloodstream they're releasing hormones and other regulatory chemicals. Now, a lot of times we'll call endocrine glands ductless glands. And that's because if you think about it, like think if we have a sweat gland, right? Here's some of the surface of my skin. Here's a sweat gland. When I sweat, it's going to come out onto the surface of the body. And it's coming out through this duct, right? That would be an exocrine gland. Well, when we're talking about an endocrine gland, it isn't releasing onto the surface of anything. It's going straight into your bloodstream. So it doesn't need to have a duct. So that's why we call them ductless glands. Um, these are gonna secrete their products right into your bloodstream or into lymphatic fluid so it can travel throughout the body and go to its target organ. And from there, it's gonna elicit some type of response. Um, so a good example, and the way I always think of your endocrine glands is um, they are essentially how your organs can communicate with each other. So you have some endocrine glands that are found in your intestines. And when food gets into your intestines, those glands secrete hormones that can travel to other organs like the pancreas and tell the pancreas to release enzymes into the intestines to help you digest your food. So it's truly how the intestines and the pancreas can communicate with each other is through hormones. Um, and so having the endocrine system and talking about these hormones, again, this is something that we'll really focus on when we get to chapter 16. Um, for this chapter, for our purposes, we're going to focus a little more on exocrine glands. Um, and I mentioned we'll talk about them here, but we'll also talk about them in chapter five when we do the skin. These are way more numerous than endocrine glands, um, and they're secreting their products straight onto the surface of the body or into open body cavities. So this would be things like mucus, sweat glands, oil glands, salivary glands. All of these are going out onto the surface of the body or an open cavity like your mouth or your nose. Now we have different kinds of exocrine glands. We have unicellular, remember uni means one. So this is a single cell that releases um, its products. So an example would be a goblet cell and I'll show you a picture of that. 
we also have multicellular exocrine glands. Multi just means many. So this is a gland that has lots of cells in it. So let's do our unicellular gland first, a goblet cell. First of all, if we look at the picture down here, we can tell that this is one single cell because it has one single nucleus, right? And so this cell you can see in green right here, this cell is creating mucus and it's storing the mucus in these little green vesicles. And those little vesicles rise to the surface of the cell and pop and they release their products, okay? So this um, goblet cell is releasing mucus into the respiratory tract or into your intestines. So it is a single cell. Now we also have multicellular glands um, that can be classified based on their function. Or, um, you know, if we think about function, what we're talking about here is their mode of secretion, so how they're secreting. So we have two kinds of multicellular glands that you need to be familiar with. One is a merocrine gland. A merocrine gland is going to be a multicellular gland that secretes its products through exocytosis. So I'm going to show you a picture of a merocrine gland. Okay, so we are looking over here on the left, right? This is a merocrine gland. First of all, if we look at this picture, we can see there's many cells here making up this gland. So we know it's multicellular. This gland, um, all the cells are making the product, storing it in vesicles, very similar to a goblet cell, releasing those products through exocytosis, and then the products can move out up through the duct and onto the surface of the body. Okay, that's a merocrine gland. So examples of merocrine glands would be like sweat glands. Sweat glands are merocrine glands. So these cells would be producing sweat, storing it in vesicles, then releasing it through exocytosis, it's coming out onto the surface of the body. Okay, so sweat glands are examples of that. The other kind of multicellular gland is called a holocrine gland. This one is very different, so its function is very different. The functions of these two um, exocrine glands are very different. A holocrine gland is this one over here on the right. And again, you can see it's a multicellular gland. You can see all the cells in here. But a holocrine gland, the cells within this gland will accumulate the products until the cell gets so big that the whole cell bursts open. So the way I remember holocrine is I remember holocrine whole cell, hollow whole. So the whole cell is bursting open at the top. Now they're trying to show you at this bottom image down here, they're trying to show you mitosis because the cells at the very bottom of this gland are constantly going through mitosis, making new cells to replace the ones that have died at the top because they've ruptured, okay? So a holocrine gland, an example of this would be like an oil gland. So what is coming out of an oil gland isn't just oil, but it's also gonna be all these cell fragments, right? All these parts and pieces. And this is why we ha always have issues with our oil glands. This is why the ducts of our oil glands can get clogged. This is why we have issues because it's not just the product coming out, it's also all the other stuff, okay? And we're gonna talk way more about our oil glands and our sweat glands in the next chapter, okay? But you do need to know for sure the difference between a merocrine and a holocrine gland. Okay, is everybody okay with those? Yeah. Good. So the last thing we're gonna talk about today is connective tissues. Um, I'm just gonna walk you through, just like we did with epithelial tissue, I'm gonna walk you through our types of connective tissue and I'll talk about how we classify connective tissues. Just all of them have the same sort of classifications, how we can identify them. So we find connective tissue basically throughout the entire body, right? Its job is to connect things. So it is the most abundant tissue we have. It's widely distributed. And there are four main classes, connective tissue proper, cartilage, bone, and blood. So connective tissue proper would be things like tendons and ligaments. 
right? This is just an example. Cartilage, bone, and blood. Which of these three, which of these four things is not like the other? Blood. Yes, blood, right? So a lot of times, and you probably, if you've read your book, you may have seen this in your textbook, blood is sort of an atypical connective tissue, right? Think tendons. These are really tough. Like if you've ever cooked chicken, you know the white stuff, the white tendons, sometimes you'll get those out of like um, if you've bought chicken tenders. Um, they're really, really tough. Um, they're slimy and tough and hard to pull. Cartilage is super tough. Bone is super tough. And then you have blood, which is a liquid. Just doesn't really fit with the others. However, I'm going to argue with you that blood is actually the best connective tissue of all. Because if we think about the function of connective tissue, it's to connect things together. And blood definitely connects everything in your body together right? So these are all connective tissues, even though we know blood is a little atypical, right? So here are some of the functions of our connective tissues. Um, they all bind and support. So bone and cartilage, these are great at binding and supporting things together. They give your body a framework. All of our connective tissues provide protection, right? Bone is very protective, right? Around your um, soft nervous tissue, you've got cranial bones, Cartilage, um, again, you've got coastal cartilage in your ribs, which is helping to provide that bony thorax and that protection around your heart and lungs. Even fat is a connective tissue that is very protective. Um, it provides insulation and protection. Another one is insulation, and that's fat. And then the last one, transportation. The only one that provides transportation is going to be blood. It's going to transport things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients, and wastes. So then if blood is so atypical, like if it doesn't really perform the same functions of your other connective tissues, if it doesn't really look and feel like your other connective tissues, why is it classified as a connective tissue? I'm going to star this slide because I'm definitely going to ask you a question about this on your exam. All of your connective tissues, all four types of connective tissues are classified as connective tissues because they have a common embryonic origin. They all come from an embryonic tissue called mesenchyme. Whoops, sorry. I don't know why my pen connects things together sometimes. So what you're looking at in this picture um, is essentially um, a very young 16 day emb old embryo. So how did we get to this embryo here, this big ball of cells? Um, you start with an egg and a sperm. Right? The egg is actually the largest cell in the body. The sperm is the smallest. So when the sperm fertilizes the egg, you get a cell with a full complement of chromosomes, 46 chromosomes. That cell then goes through mitosis and makes identical copies of itself over time and creates a big ball of cells, right? And this, those are called embryonic stem cells. So that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at this big ball of cells. How, these cells haven't really differentiated yet, right? They haven't become bones and muscles and um, skin, and they haven't become um, what they're going to be yet. But in, at around 16 days, what we start to see is that that big ball of cells, the cells are sort of striated. And we have these three layers. And blue is an ectoderm. And we know that these layers of cells in the ectoderm, they're going to give rise to things like nervous tissue. We know in yellow, that's the endoderm. That's going to give rise to things like epithelial tissue. And then in red, in the middle, that's our mesoderm. And that is going to give rise to all of our connective tissues. And so that's why we call that the mesenchyme. We say all connective tissue comes from that middle layer called the mesenchyme. Okay. So that's why blood is also a connective tissue. It's coming from the mesenchyme, middle layer. So let's talk about some characteristics of um, connective tissue. 
it is very different from epithelial tissue. One thing that makes it really different is that, you know, remember I told you epithelium does not have a blood supply. And connective tissue can. Um, it actually has varying degrees of that, sorry, varying degrees of vascularity. So you might have some connective tissue that is avascular. Remember, no blood supply. A means not. So an example might be things like cartilage, right? People who have damaged the cartilage in their knees, a lot of times it's really slow to heal, if it ever heals at all, because there's really no blood supply to your cartilage. But then we have other connective tissues like bone that have a fabulous blood supply, right? You break a bone, even if it's a big bone like your femur, it can heal within a matter of weeks because it has a wonderful blood supply. So connective tissues can have no blood supply or a great blood supply. Just depends on which one we're looking at. One other thing that's very different about connective tissue compared to your epithelial tissue is that connective tissue is not just a bunch of cells. There's a lot of non-living extra cellular stuff. We call it extracellular matrix. So when we look at connective tissues under the microscope, you're gonna see a lot of other stuff. You'll see some nuclei in there where you can see the cells, but then you're gonna see a lot of fibers and a lot of liquid in there. And it's that kind of stuff that gives your connective tissue certain characteristics. Um, like for example, you have different kinds of cartilage. Like the cartilage that's in your nose um, and your ears allows your ears to wiggle. This has a fiber in it called an elastic fiber, and it gives it the structure that lets it be more movable and elastic. Whereas um, the cartilage that's found at the ends of your bones, right? If you've ever eaten a chicken wing, you know, and you get all the way to the bone, that really hard white stuff at the end of the bone that's real slick, that's a different kind of cartilage. That's not nearly the same. It doesn't have the same characteristics as what's in your nose or your ears, right? So it's all of this extracellular stuff that actually gives the structure um, a lot of its characteristics. So when we talk about our connective tissues, right? So here are some structural elements of your connective tissues. So one thing that we find is that all connective tissues have something called a ground substance. A ground substance is basically the liquid that we find in the tissue. We also have in our connective tissues fibers. And the fibers look exactly what they sound like they would look like. They look like strings. We have different kinds. We have collagen, elastic, or reticular fibers. These two things together make up your extracellular matrix. And then the other thing that you'll find in your connective tissue are the cells. That's the third thing. Okay, so fibers and ground substance together make up the extracellular matrix. And then we have cells. And the cells are going to vary based on the type of tissue we're looking at. So this is a great example. This is just a picture from your book. And it is showing um, how we have, you can see in the background, there's a lot of liquid in here. There's all these fibers running every which way. That's all the extracellular matrix. And then you can see the cells, right? Here's a cell, and here's a cell, and here's the cell. But they're kind of scattered. They're not jam-packed like epithelial tissue. Now, what we find is that a lot of times, um, I'm going to walk you through our ground substance and our fibers. I'm going to walk you through the extracellular matrix. The ground substance is the liquid stuff. And this is sort of like um, a sieve. It lets nutrients pass through that tissue. And so the ground substance is made, obviously, of a fluid. We call it an interstitial fluid. The term interstitial just means tissue. In the fluid, we also have something called adhesion proteins. Think of the word adhesion, right? It means to adhere to. It is like glue. It sticks everything together. And then lastly, in our ground substance, we have something called proteoglycans. 
proteoglycans are something called glycosaminoglycans. A lot of times in your book, they'll call it, they'll call them gags for short. So let me see if I can explain these in a way that makes sense. Um, I drew a little proteoglycan down at the bottom. So there's a red line with some little green, they look like bottle brushes coming off. So proteoglycan would be the red line. Glycosaminoglycans are little green structures that look like sponges or bottle brushes. The more of those little green glycosaminoglycans that you find on this structure, the more water you can trap. So the more viscous or liquidy the ground substance will be. So the less gags you have on a proteoglycan, the less water you can trap and the more stiff the ground substance will be. So an example might be cartilage. The ground substance in cartilage has proteoglycans and it has a certain number of gags in it. So cartilage does have some flexibility to it. Whereas the proteoglycans that are in bone, those have a lot less gags, can't trap as much water. So bone is not nearly as flexible. It's not as liquidy as cartilage is, okay? So that's the role of a proteoglycan. It helps to trap the water and it can make your ground substance more liquidy or more stiff, okay, depending on the number of gags. Now we also have um, in our extracellular matrix, we have fibers. Depending on which connective tissue we're looking at, we'll determine which kind of fiber we have. So collagen fibers, um, not always, but most of the time under a microscope, these will look very thick and pink in color. Collagen fibers are the toughest, strongest fiber that we have. Um, they are cross-linking fibers. They are stronger than steel. So if we take a piece of steel that's the same diameter as a piece of collagen, collagen is a thousand times stronger than that piece of steel. So they are very, very strong. So they provide a lot of strength to a tissue when you have them. They also have the ability to absorb a lot of water, okay? Elastic fibers, not always, but most of the time, these are really skinny, they're thin, and they're really dark in color under the microscope. So a lot of times they might be black or like a navy blue and they're real skinny. These are long coiled fibers and they are just like what they sound like they are. They are elastic -y. they're very stretchy. And then lastly, our reticular fibers. And a lot of times these are thick and dark under the microscope. These are very similar to collagen fibers. They're just a little more delicate, okay? And then the last thing that we find in our connective tissue are cells. So cells of connective tissue can be found in two forms. One is an immature form we call a blast. The other is a mature cell that's called a site. So remember, we have four kinds of connective tissues. We have connective tissue proper, like tendons and ligaments. And in connective tissue proper, you would have a type of cell called a fibroblast or a fibrocyte. The blast, the immature cell, I, again, I always think of these as the babies. Um, so I always joked before I had my child, I joked that, um, you know, I'm going to have a house full of kids because then they can help clean and like cut the grass and do stuff. If y'all have kids, you know that that is not what happens. <laughs> but, you know, I always think of these young cells as like the workhorses, right? They're going to do all the work. And that's true. Fibroblasts actually make the tissue. So a fibroblast cell sort of puts this tissue around and it's making the tissue. And once it's done its job and it's made tissue all the way around itself, it now becomes a mature cell called a site. It grows up, right? So you have a fibroblast or a fibrocyte in connective tissue proper. In cartilage, we have chondroblasts or chondrocytes. Now remember in chapter one, when we talked about our abdominopelvic regions, like our hypochondriac regions, remember chondro means cartilage. So chondroblast literally means cartilage cell. Chondrocyte, cartilage cell. Okay, and the difference is that the blast is making the tissue. Once the tissue's been made, it becomes a site. 
Same thing with osteoblasts and osteocytes. Osteo means bone. So that should be easy for you to remember that that's in bone. And again, you know, blood is atypical. Um, so it doesn't follow the blast site rule. So for the immature blood cells, we have what are called hematopoietic stem cells. Hematopoietic stem cells can become any kind of blood cell. They can become red blood cells or any kind of white blood cell. Okay, and once they're mature, they're a blood cell. Now other cells that we might find in our connective tissues would be things like white blood cells, plasma cells, macrophages, mast cells. All of those are involved in immunity. So if you see a type of connective tissue, and maybe I tell you, here's a connective tissue that has fibrocytes in it and mast cells, macrophages, white blood cells, plasma cells, what's the function of that tissue? It's going to be immunity. Okay, if it's got all these immune system cells, its big function will be immunity. So this is an image from um, your book. Now this image that I'm using here, this is, um, I think it's two editions removed. I have uh, the current edition, I have that picture a little later, a couple slides later, but I have left this one in, in your notes because I really like this one. Um, I'm sad that they took this one went, went away. Um, this image is great for connective tissues. I think this is a great place when you're trying to study and kind of get your mind wrapped around connective tissues. This is a great place to start because if we start at the top, you can see that we've got mesenchyme. Remember, all connective tissues come from that embryonic tissue called mesenchyme. And then it moves into your cells, right? Fibroblasts. Fibroblasts turn into fibrocytes and those form connective tissue proper. We can see chondroblasts turn into chondrocytes. Those form cartilage. Osteoblasts turn into osteocytes, which make bone. Hematopoietic stem cells turn into blood cells and they make blood. And so this is great because it's showing you from the cells at the very beginning, um, if a mesenchymal cell differentiates and becomes an osteoblast, for example, you know you're gonna get bone. Then it also goes through all the subclasses. Now we haven't gone through this yet, but this is gonna go through all of the different subclasses for connective tissue proper. All the different types of cartilage, the bone, and your blood. So this is a great place when you're studying to kind of start, just to get your mind wrapped around all the subclasses and the types of cells that each connective tissue has. So before we go into our connective tissues, and we only have about 10 minutes left um, for lecture this morning, but before we go through connective tissues, um, I do want to tell you that there are a lot of connective tissues. Like, here's all the connective tissues that we'll go through. Um, there's a ton of them, um, and all of them have a living component, so they all have cells but they all have that extracellular matrix, the ground substance and the fibers. And so the type of connective tissue that you are looking at, whether it is in lab or in the lecture, the type of tissue you're looking at, if it's connective, is gonna depend on the three things listed. And the very first thing is cell type. Cell type will tell you a lot. If you know that the type of cell in that tissue is an osteocyte, then you know you're looking at bone. If you know that the type of cell, if I tell you, hey, this tissue has fibrocytes in it, you know it's a connective tissue proper. Or this tissue has chondrocytes, you know it's cartilage. So the cell type will tell you a lot about the tissue. The second is fiber type. Let's say I tell you, hey, this tissue has chondrocytes in it and a lot of elastic fibers. Well, then you know chondrocytes are found in cartilage, and one type of cartilage is called elastic cartilage. It has tons of elastic fibers in it. So there you know what kind of tissue you're looking at. So just be aware, especially when you get to the exam, be aware of what kind of information I'm giving you. Cell type and fiber type tell you a lot when it comes to connective tissues. And then also the amount. One of the types of tissues, like connective tissue proper, um, we classify into loose and dense. So the amount of, of um, fibers that you have, how jam-packed everything is, will tell you a lot. So here's our connective tissues that we'll walk through. Um, the first one that we'll do, um, we'll do these on Wednesday, 
is connective tissue proper. So we have, um, the, remember these are things like ligaments and tendons. So connective tissue proper is divided into a loose and a dense connective tissue proper. We'll also go through our three types of cartilage on Wednesday. We'll talk about our bone and our blood. Okay, so those are our connective tissues that we will walk through. Um, we have a few minutes. I may go ahead and start into our um, loose connective tissues, just so I make sure that we finish chapter four by Wednesday. Does anybody have any questions so far? Y'all are very quiet. Everybody good? Yes. Okay. Um, so our loose connective tissue, like areolar connective tissue is one. Um, I love the name of this. Areolar tells you right there in the name, it's airy. It's very spread out. It's a loose tissue. So this type of connective tissue proper, it has all three fibers in it. So it has collagen, elastic, and reticular. So all three fibers are here. The type of cell is a fibroblast, because remember, we're dealing with connective tissue proper. But it also has macrophages, mast cells, white blood cells. So you know that the function of this tissue is immunity. Where do we find it? Everywhere. If its function is immunity, we're gonna find it pretty much everywhere. Where we find areolar tissue is directly underneath our skin. So if you were to take your skin and kind of peel off that first layer, that epidermis, right underneath that epithelial tissue, you have areolar tissue. So now think about where we find it, all over the body. That's great because if something, if you get a cut and something's able to make it through your skin, through your epidermis, through that epithelial tissue, you've got areolar tissue with white blood cells and macrophages and mast cells that are there ready to fight the infection. Um, so we have it all over the body. It does have a lot of tissue fluid in it. And if it gets damaged, it'll ac actually soak up more fluid and lead to swelling, which we call edema. And so this is why a lot of times, you know, if you've ever noticed if you get a cut, if you feel the cut, a lot of times the edges feel real swollen. That's because of that underlying areolar tissue. It's soaked up a lot of fluid. This is an image of areolar tissue. So again, remember I've been talking about how connective tissue is not just cells, right? We can see the fibroblast nuclei sort of spread out in here, but now what you see are a lot of fibers. The big, thick pink ones, those are collagen, and the skinny little black ones, those are elastic fibers. Okay, and then you can see all the white space. That's just ground substance. This is why we call this airy olar tissue, right? It's very spread out. Another loose connective tissue that I'm going to walk you through is adipose tissue. This just means fat. So this is fat tissue. This has a matrix that's really similar to areolar, but the cells are a little pa more packed together. And the type of cell is very specialized. Instead of calling it fibroblasts, that's what they are, we're still connective tissue proper, we give them a special name. Because if we think about a cell, right, normally like an animal cell, it has a nucleus in the middle and it has all these organelles all over the place. In a cell that's in fat tissue, normal animal cells have little vesicles that store stuff. And when we're looking at fat tissue, Fat cells have a vesicle in them storing fat, and that vesicle takes up almost the entire space of the cell. And that means all the organelles kind of get mushed to the outside, like the nucleus is kind of mushed to the outside. So instead of just calling these fibroblasts, because they look a little different with that big drop of fat in them, we call them adipose sites. And their big function is just the function of fat. Um, they store food. They insulate. Um, they support and they protect your body. So that is the big function of your fat tissue. 
We've pretty much find it everywhere. It is under your skin. Um, it's great for protection. We find it around really active organs like the kidneys have fat around them, not only because they're storing nutrients for your kidneys, but also they're protecting your kidneys. We find it in the front of your abdomen. Remember the greater omentum that y'all had to identify in lab last week? That's a layer of fat, it's nice and protective. And then in some of our reproductive organs as well. So here is an image of that. And so you can see here, like this right here, this is an adipose site. And notice how the inside is all white. That's a big droplet of fat. See how the nucleus got mushed to the outside? See this one here, it's mushed to the outside. So that's how you know you're looking at fat. It looks like a little oil droplet right in there. Okay, so that is adipose tissue still a loose connective tissue. Now the last thing I'm going to mention um, before we're done with lecture today is a little bit about fat in general. Now this picture of fat is white fat. So this is white adipose tissue. That's what you have in your body. That's typical for an adult. But babies have a type of fat called brown adipose tissue. And what makes it brown in color is mitochondria. Does anybody remember what mitochondria do in your cells? What is their function? They make something. Protein. Not protein. ATP, they make energy. So a lot of times people call them the powerhouse of the cell, right? So mitochondria are really dark in color and they make energy. So you're gonna have a lot of mitochondria in very active tissues in the body. Um, a great example is like um, chicken. I like white meat, but some people like dark meat. Just so you know, dark meat is like the wings, right? The legs. These are the more active tissues. They're, it's dark in color because there's more mitochondria in there. So that is what gives the meat a darker color. It's the same thing with adipose tissue. Brown adipose tissue has more mitochondria in it. It's more active. And so we find brown tissue in babies that can't shiver yet to warm up. And so it burns through the fat a lot faster. So in babies, we find it in their shoulder blades, the anterior, lateral neck, so kind of on the sides of the neck of a baby, and in their abdomen. Uh, my little boy, he's eight now, but he had this, he looked like a little beer belly when he was a baby, big old belly. Um, and so this is just helping them to um, heat their body. And brown adipose tissue burns really fast. Um, there are some people that are thin their whole lives. In fact, there are people that um, ha have to eat. They have to try to gain weight. It's hard for them to gain weight. We don't like those people. Um, but for those people who are trying to gain weight, a lot of times what we found is that they actually, as adults, have brown adipose tissue um, instead of white adipose tissue. So they just burn it really fast. So they're naturally more thin. Okay, but typically we only find it in babies. All right, so I'll stop here. Um, it's 10 o'clock. Um, is everybody okay so far with chapter four with tissues? We've done epithelial and a little bit of connective tissue. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. So we will finish chapter four on Wednesday. We'll be able to finish all of the rest of your tissues um, on Wednesday. And um, I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna pop over into our other Zoom for lab and I'm gonna walk you through that lab PDF document, okay? So maybe I will see you all. If I don't see you, remember it will be recorded, okay? All right. <laughs>